Um, hello everyone. I would like to to start the session now. So first, I would like to thank you all for joining the inclusive humanitarian response gender and disability session. Um, I would like to introduce myself first. This is Sabrina Dweb, inclusion specialist working with HI and the Global Protection Cluster. My colleague Oshana. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Hanan Zannoun. I'm Senior Gender Advisor uh, with Jenka. So Emma will provide you with some uh, instructions before we start the session. Please, Emma. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, this is just to let you know that this uh, space has translation enabled for French and Arabic speakers. So if you would like to go to the three dots at the top of your screen and click on more and then select language and speech, you can choose language interpretation and you can choose whether you would like this to be in French or in Arabic. Um, please also note that this session will be recorded. OK, thank you, Sabrine. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, let's just start with the first slide, please. Emma. Yeah, so I would like to first to, to go through the uh, session today and the agenda. So um, today we are aiming to introduce specific concepts around gender and disability. We will go through the analysis of gender and disability through the humanitarian cycle, program cycle, and we will look at why it's important to do this analysis for gender and disability. We are going to look to some of the methods and tools and frameworks that are available for you. Also, we are going to share with you a lot of resources as a secondary uh, tools and uh, material that you can use in your field. We will look to the gender analysis matrix and uh, analytical approach on aiming on how to use the data and the importance of using the data. While also we will go through some concrete recommendations from several um, uh, operations that uh, me and Hanan we worked with. Just one highlight, I would like to, to give you the chance that during our presentation, it will be a participatory approach. So please just raise your hand to, to come in uh, through the discussion and to raise any highlights that you want to, to talk about. Um, it's, um, it's not a presentation that just for uh, me and Hanan to talk. It's also giving you the chance to share your insight and input. Thank you so much. So, Hanan, we'll start with the first slide, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sabrine. Hello, everyone. Um, we will start by uh, defining what is gender and why we are uh, uh, working on gender, disability, and inclusion. So, uh, I'm sharing with you uh, uh, two uh, charts. One is talking about the uh, the gender if we take it as uh, in silos uh, and how can we use intersectionality uh, in in our operation and how uh, this would contribute for a, a better results so uh, uh, what is gender gender is the biological uh, sex and uh, gender uh, um, orientation and gender identity how I was born, uh, how do I look at myself and how people look at me uh, from a sex perspective. However, if we want to talk about intersectionality, and this is uh, how uh, do we recommend when talking about gender and when we uh, identify gender. So gender is uh, in addition to the uh, biological and the orientation and identity uh, of sex, it's uh, um, adding to that we will talk about uh, age. So if, for example, we are talking about women, who is this woman? In which age? In which religion? So we, we, we cannot separate the uh, religion from uh, the sex or from the identity of this person. Uh, the social status. Is she married? Is she divorced? Is she uh, widowed? For example, uh, if the woman is widowed, she has some implications in the society. 
and the society is looking at her uh, in, in a different way. Uh, resources, who can access to resources, who owns uh, uh, the resources. The schooling, it's not only the education, like how I was raised, what I have learned since I was uh, young. Uh, location, uh, uh, taking the, the same example when we are talking about women. Uh, uh, who is this woman? Where uh, does she live? Is she living in a camp? Is she living in rural area? Is she living in city? Is she educated? Uh, is she young? Is she old? Uh, even uh, we will talk about ethnicities because some of the ethnicities in some context, they are very uh, vulnerable. And um, why we are talking uh, in, in intersectional or why we are encouraging it intersectional uh, approaches in addition to the uh, sex, because it would impact and it would affect the uh, different uh, elements. It would affect the division of, uh, of labor. It would affect the roles and responsibilities. If the uh, community say uh, that I'm woman, uh, some communities would say you cannot drive a car because you are woman, or you cannot uh, do this and that because you are a uh, woman. Uh, access to resources. If I'm, uh, for example, um, uh, disabled and uh, Sabrine will uh, come uh, in a few minutes and uh, would uh, give us uh, the context of disability, like if I'm uh, disabled, uh, what type of disability that I have and how can I access uh, to, re uh, to resources? Uh, decision making. Uh, some ethnicities, they don't have the access uh, to decision making. If I'm a woman, I don't have uh, access to decision maker uh, in, in some context. Uh, if I'm from a different religion, I cannot access to uh, decision making. Uh, one of the main issues that we also uh, uh, cover when we talk about the ass uh, assessment, um, we are looking for the opportunities. Who has the opportunities? What available opportunities for each and single uh, member of the community? Uh, uh, bo uh, power uh, uh, roles and, uh, and dynamic. Um, uh, we, we can look at, uh, uh, at the family uh, a household and we can go out uh, to the community who has the power, who can uh, distribute the roles, uh, who has um, uh, like the, uh, the role of doing what. So uh, by uh, taking the intersectional approach in doing the gender analysis, it would give us a, a, like a comprehensive approach and it would lead to uh, better results. Uh, next, please, uh, Amri. As Sabrine uh, was saying, we are taking uh, uh, the program cycle or the humanitarian uh, program cycle as an approach. And we found that the most important uh, part of this cycle is the gender analysis. Uh, which includes uh, uh, sex, age, and disability. Uh, Sabrine also will uh, talk in, in details about uh, people with disabilities and will talk about uh, inclusion. So what is that? Sex, age, and disability. Uh, when we are talking about SAD in the analysis, we are looking on the impact. What is the different impacts affecting the lives of boys, girls, men and boys, uh, men and women uh, from the different uh, ethnicities, vulnerabilities, disabilities, and even uh, the disabilities are different from person to person and from uh, disability to another. Uh, also, we are looking for the needs. And when we are looking for the needs, we are looking for the uh, uh, practical needs, strategic needs, and immediate needs. And uh, uh, there are some uh, different uh, differences between the, uh, those needs. So the uh, practical needs are the actual uh, conditions and the actual uh, needs related to the role of uh, some people. For example, uh, uh, for women, they need uh, uh, some uh, uh, different uh, non-food items than uh, men, than 
uh, elderly than children, for example, we need diapers, we need uh, a formula uh, for some children. Uh, uh, we need the strategic needs that uh, are uh, adding uh, uh, some empowerment and some uh, long term uh, uh, resilience um, uh, elements. If we are looking for immediate needs, the things that keeping people uh, uh, alive, uh, that uh, sometimes it's the same and sometimes in other contexts uh, are uh, different. Uh, next, please. So when we are talking about the analysis, uh, we will give more attention into that this phase uh, because we rely on the analysis to be able to build our response. For example, why we are required to have a proper analysis regarding, for example, for persons with disabilities. It's an estimated that 1.3 billion people around the world that they are experience disability which means it's around 16 percent of the world population. If we are going through this general analysis without any deep information of what does that mean or how we can use this type of information, it means that we are unable to build a very tailored support into communities. For example, in this data, we can find that one in five are women with disabilities, while one in 10 are children with disabilities. While four and five live in the poorest countries and two and three, they are belonging to the poorest population group. So we will go through this uh, process or this session to ensure that even with having secondary data, it's not enough. So which steps and further steps that we should take to be able to build the proper uh, analysis to be able to respond to the immediate need or strategical need, as Hannah was mentioning. Please, next slide. Why we are putting more uh, uh, spot on the gender and disability? When, inter when the intersectionality comes with gender and disability, and the gender and disability interact, discrimination multiplies. For women with disability experiencing multi-phase forms of discrimination and negative, and negative stereotypical attitudes in every domain of life. As I mentioned, it's one in five women around the world are excluded from fully participating in society, family, and work life. They are facing more barriers compared with women without disabilities or compared with men. So it means that uh, women with disability may face discrimination based on their intersex identities, such as religion, race, age, sexual orientation, or gender identity. That's why it's required not to look to the general information of having only one in five women in the world are women with disabilities, but we need to look to how these factors also intersect to be able to understand how these women are facing or experience disabilities within their communities in very clear and detailed way to be able to respond to their needs and to be able to respond to a, with an inclusive approach. Next slide. Emma, next one. So uh, building on what uh, uh, Sabrine was uh, talking about, uh, by understanding the details or looking in the underlying causes of the issues. Sabrine was saying like one in uh, five uh, women are disabled around the world. How they became disabled? What is the community uh, uh, mechanisms are offered to those women? How can the community support those, uh, those women? How the community looks at those women? And what are the root, uh, root causes of uh, such issues? For example, if there is the, uh, um, inequality or uh, those uh, one in five uh, women uh, are uh, uh, like excluded, why in which base? So we need to understand the underlying causes of each uh, barrier or each uh, uh, issue. 
the risk. Uh, we need uh, first to understand the risk uh, accompanied of this intersectional uh, part. For example, if the woman is uh, disabled, what is uh, the risk that she's uh, put in? If there is a risk, if there is no risk, and if I'm uh, doing a program, what is the risk that my program would add? So I need to understand all of the risks behind the intervention and what is the risk uh, uh, compiled with the uh, vulnerability or with, with the person, the individual. Um, also, when we are looking at uh, SAD or the gender, age and disability analysis, we should look at the empowerment. First, what is available in the community as empowerment for the different groups, for women, men, boys and girls, youth. Sometimes youth are uh, really marginalized in, in many communities. So what's uh, available uh, empowerment uh, uh, tools, mechanisms, uh, programs, uh, policies are available at the community. On the other hand, while conducting the exercise of the analysis, we should empower the community. Like we should not uh, exclude them or uh, building on assumptions, uh, including or engaging uh, people in our analysis would really empower the results and would give a uh, more uh, comprehensive and uh, accepted uh, approaches. Uh, access, uh, how uh, the, the vulnerability or how uh, the different groups have access to resources and opportunities. Uh, and also what uh, opportunities are available for the uh, members and uh, what uh, opportunities are available for us as a humanitarian workers uh, to support the community and building on what is existing. Yes, 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 yes. mind that please, if you have any highlights, just raise your hand and you can come in. If you have any point that you would like to clarify or to so please just uh, feel free to, to raise your hand. Yeah, any question? Any comment? So um, going back to the risk, like why we are uh, uh, really uh, taking uh, to consideration uh, the gender dynamic or the gender age and disability with the risk uh, and resilience. Um, like as a humanitarian, we are not uh, trying to uh, support uh, dependence. Like uh, we are not creating dependence on uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, the contrary, while even we are giving the uh, assistance, we are uh, trying to um, create uh, independent uh, community. Uh, in, uh, like a community that is a uh, part of the response at all levels. Uh, we are uh, creating resilience. We are creating a kind of dignity. Like uh, we, when we are uh, looking at the disaster impact, we should uh, see the risk at uh, uh, the different uh, vulnerable groups, the exposure, uh, the vulnerability if uh, the risk is increasing the vulnerability of those groups, uh, reducing my intervention. Does it increase or uh, uh, decrease the, uh, the risk? Um, are we prepared? Uh, for example, we have um, uh, when we had the earthquake in the northwest uh, Syria, uh, there was a, a kind of a lack of preparedness. Uh, at the community, and it was uh, something new that they never uh, witnessed. Uh, so um, uh, it, it created kind of uh, uh, a panic, and it increased the vulnerability of the vulnerable uh, groups. For example, uh, uh, when we uh, were talking to people with disabilities, uh, there was a woman with her uh, daughter that were disabled. Uh, the lady was saying that I uh, am living at the uh, second floor and uh, I saw the other buildings collapsing uh, around me. 
So the only thing that I, I was able to do because I was not able to go uh, down the stairs, uh, I started to uh, uh, cross down to uh, the uh, to the gate, the main gate of the house. So if the house was collapsed, so my, the people would find my body. So uh, this has increased the vulnerability of uh, uh, those people. What are the uh, coping uh, capacities of the community? And uh, like when we saw the uh, earthquake uh, response, we found that uh, uh, there is a youth capacity in the uh, area, and while also uh, the humanitarian workers were also affected, but we found them uh, standing from the first moment uh, responding to uh, to the earthquake. So. Also, we want to see the disaster impact, but also we will see where are the areas of gender inequalities? Who are the uh, most disadvantaged group? What are the uh, uh, contributors of the inequalities? Is it from the society? Is it from the hazard itself? And then we should come up with disaster risk management plan or uh, integrate uh, risk uh, management uh, in our uh, response and uh, plan. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, let me just highlight before starting. Uh, we will have a question first before I start. So please, uh, yes, Yashi. Yashi. Yashi, please come in. Yes, good. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm listening to you from, from Ethiopia. It is a very interesting session. Uh, my question is that uh, do the humanitarian aid sector have monitoring experience, monitoring of uh, how gender is treated? addressed how inclusion is treated and addressed especially on the perspective of the multi uh, the multi uh, the intersectional approach that you explained it is new to me if you have ex that experience the monitoring experience if it needs to be planned it needs to be implemented then it needs to be monitored then lessons to be driven and correction is to be taken corrective action is to be taken in the humanitarian aid sector so how does the experience look like thank you very much yeah this is a great uh, question maybe we can ask uh, answer your question uh, later because we will go through the how now we are uh, uh, talking about uh, what and then we will move to the how in in a few minutes if you allow me uh, yashi Thank you very much. It's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So before starting to to define risks facing persons with disabilities, I will go back to one step to define disability. So the disability uh, based on the right based approach, it's a evolving concept that it comes or result from the interaction between a person's impairment and a barrier which lead to uh, increase the risks and increase the risk of vulnerability in the community for people who are experiencing these barriers. So as a concept, it means that if a person with a long-term impairment uh, facing these barriers, which we can also use the word the threat uh, in the definition of barriers, they are facing these barriers in their community, the, the, the risks will be increased that they are uh, unable to access a humanitarian services due to these barriers. So to be able to eliminate these risks, we need to look to how we are able to deal and overcome with barriers. So how we are able to increase the enabler factors for people who are experiencing uh, uh, disability to be able to reach to resilience and improve their uh, ability and safety and protection. That's, what does that mean? 
That means that, for example, if I'm, uh, I'm defining the risk facing persons with disabilities, I should understand how the interact happens between the persons with different type of impairments, whatever that is a visual impairment, hearing impairment, intellectual impairment, physical impairment, and how the, the, this person or individual experience these barriers in their communities and how that when Hanan was mentioning how this impact this experience, how this impact the ability to access to services or prevent access to services, how this is impact equal opportunities in the communities compared with persons without disabilities. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned that when we are defining disabilities, we rely on the UNCRPD, the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So we need to understand the types of these uh, uh, barriers and how these barriers lead to denial of rights to humanitarian services. So for example, when we are talking about attitudinal barriers, which means the perception and how people are perceiving persons with disabilities in a specific communities, this might lead to the denial of rights to humanitarian services or lead to bullying, discrimination, exploitation, abuse. And this will link to the denial of rights or to independence, health and safety. Uh, in several situations, and I will give the example in Syria, there was uh, some people with disabilities that they were sharing sometimes that they were dropping opportunities with the humanitarian services uh, due to the attitude uh, uh, to the attitude of the humanitarian field stuff. And sometimes uh, we we use attitude barriers, but we don't specify. So we need to understand the roots of what does that mean. Some people they might feel that they are different. And they are targeted in a way that, yeah, the, the support is uh, overprotected to them. And some people, they might be avoid dealing with persons with disabilities due to that perception that maybe persons with disabilities, they need a lot of supervision or maybe persons with disabilities are unable to perform in, uh, in some of the opportunities in the community. So. When we are looking to define these barriers and understand it, we need to, to have a deep analysis. What does that mean? And not to keep it as a general as we are I'm using here as attitudinal barrier. For example, a lot of uh, 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 children with disabilities at school, they were in high risk of bullying and being discriminated from other children. So how we are able to address and understand how these children are experience these disabilities, this disability and how the interaction with these type of attitudinal barrier and how we are able to ensure we are working to address these uh, barriers within, for example, the school environment. While communication barriers lead to denial of rights to humanitarian services, for example, uh, informed consent or safety in time of emergencies. Um, for example, one of the, the uh, ways that we are using these days is that using a lot of websites to, to share information. We are using online information. How we are ensuring that this information is accessible that persons with disabilities are able to, to use. Uh, I, I will address it, yeah. So, um, for example, it's also to ensure that we are able to, to use several approaches of uh, sharing information to be able to overcome communication barriers. While physical barriers, it leads to denial of rights to humanitarian services when there is, for example, no uh, action are taken to do any uh, adaptation or um, improve access to specific services or locations. For example, if we are using uh, that persons are unable to access to latrine, that might to, uh, lead to a lot of complication of the skin, 
uh, a lot of complication to chest infections. So, and this will increase the risk of having a lot of complication of health, the uh, complication that requires long-term treatment and uh, people might lose some of the dignity when they are relying on others to, to take care of them due to the uh, unaccess to, to latrine. When we are talking about institutional barriers, and one of the example also is the, the data and having information, it's the denial of the rights of uh, access to humanitarian services and compounded when, uh, inequalities and increased risk of negative coping strategies. For example, lacking of data about needs of persons with disabilities, about information and how people are experienced disabilities might lead that people are taking negative coping uh, mechanism like bagging, trafficking, so they are in a higher risk of a protection uh, concerns or protection risk, and they, uh, they increase the vulnerability and prevent them from accessing to humanitarian services. Sorry, there is some uh, highlights in the chat. Let me just look at it before going to... Uh, Yes, it, to, to be honest, when we are talking about uh, attitudinal barriers, even sometimes mm -hmm. people are using, in a way, a positive words, like uh, describing persons with disabilities that they are heroes, they are super powerful people, and uh, this is always putting people in a way that they are different. So yes, there is a lot of uh, wording that might be used in the communities uh, to describe persons with disabilities, even giving nicknames uh, uh, like um, uh, uh, deaf people, uh, some, uh, some Arabic even words that can give families names as nicknames for type of impairment. So this is how sometimes that even describing persons with disabilities disabilities is a way of discri uh, discrimination, even if sometimes we thought that the, the wording is a positive wording. I see Stephanie, please come in. Thank you. Sorry, I just have technical issues. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to mention and thank you for organizing this. Um, realizing now, uh, also being in Ukraine that, uh, and I include myself in this, um, that among humanitarians, I feel the attitudinal barriers are so, so high. Um, I've had several workshops and trainings, and you always see um, we're working on language, no? which is an important part. But even despite this, how patronizing it is, how we assume persons with disabilities cannot do certain things, we only focus on the disability. So I do feel, and I think Sabrina, you've raised it in the attitudinal barriers in Syria as well, know that uh, we are a key part that we need to work with. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I, I totally agree. Thank you, Stephanie. Also, there is a point about age will also have a further influence or impact on how the person will experience disability in the community. Totally agree. Thank you, Marlene, for raising this. Yeah, 60% of older persons might experience disabilities. Also, it's applicable to, to look to how um, uh, persons or um, different age groups also might experience disabilities in the, in the communities. Uh, I know that also there is a lot of perception uh, toward older persons and that sometimes we stereotype uh, people in specific categories when we are talking about even their age or uh, their type of disabilities, for example, I know uh, if we are talking about persons with intellectual disabilities, they are one of the among the highest uh, people who are facing discrimination and being uh, in a high risk of uh, protection concern when we are uh, looking to different types of disabilities. So also among types of disabilities, we need to understand the differences of how people are experiencing these barriers within their communities. Hadia, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Hanan and Sabrine. This is a very important subject and 
we think that it only covers about 10 to 15 percent of the population, which is also very substantive. But uh, it's also a responsibility of not leaving anyone behind and understanding the diverse needs to which we need to respond during a humanitarian crisis. There's no such thing as a blanket response. It has to be tailored so that we don't uh, perpetuate the power imbalances, discrimination, the exclusion as we move along. In this slide, I was actually in 2019, I was in Syria uh, uh, working with UNARWA as a disability advisor uh, with NORCAP and I saw that, I mean, my mind was opened to the first, the UN Disability um, Inclusion Strategy, which is something that all agencies are supposed to report upon on an annual basis. And then also in 2019 came the IASC Disability Inclusion Guidelines. Do you think that they are adequately socialized? And I feel as if the GenCap and other exclusion uh, mechanisms don't really converge to talk about it in a combined way. Do you think that that is something that uh, you would advocate for? Thank you. Thank you so much. I know even I, met, I, I didn't mention in one of the slides it was written, even though there is a lot of policies might talk about disability, but we still lacking the inclusive humanitarian response. That's why, to be honest, we have experienced me and Hanan in, in Syria when we are talking about, yeah, sometimes if you are talking about disability, people will think, yeah, it's only a person has a disability without looking to the gender or age or to the, to the socioeconomic situation. That's why, based on our experience that we find out, let's Let's merge and try to keep advocating that when you are talking and analyzing uh, gender or disability or age, please take, be sure that you are taking into account all of these intersect, uh, uh, sector uh, factors when you are planning your intervention. And we will go to the how because there is concrete actions that we should take into account to be able to uh, to build a tailored and inclusive response without leaving anyone behind. If I might add also in Dignify, this is very important uh, principle that we have to focus on the dignity of people and the resilience. Even those people with disability, we should treat them in a dignity and resilience manner. Uh, if there is no further highlights, we can move to the next slide, please. Yeah, so. Uh, hello, you will yes, uh, so uh, we will talk about the importance of the sad, sex, age and disability uh, uh, information or while we are uh, focusing on doing gender analysis uh, in each intervention. Like as we said that uh, uh, gender analysis should come uh, along with any need assessment or the rapid analysis with gap analysis, we should include the SAD. Uh, we should uh, focus on a number of uh, uh, persons affected, but in which group, in which area, in which ethnicity, and in all of these uh, details. Um, so what, uh, uh, why uh, it's important, we identify the social and structural barriers, the barriers that uh, Sabrine was talking about uh, in details, uh, the level of barriers and the drivers of any, doc uh, any problem. Like if we are talking about um, like um, uh, disability barriers, um, so uh, those barriers, uh, if we want to uh, see in which level of uh, like uh, community, how much, for example, if we take the Syrian, the Northwest uh, Syria, there are almost 29% of the community have uh, disability. If we look at the elderly at the uh, Northwest, 90% of the elderly have disability. So what are the drivers of those disabilities? 
the conflict contributed a lot to uh, making those people uh, uh, disabled. Uh, more, uh, moreover, like we have some, uh, uh, for example, some uh, boys and girls are going to uh, uh, seek uh, some recycling materials to sell for surviving and they uh, be attacked by uh, landmines. So we need to understand where is the problem exactly in order to uh, respond. Uh, it, it helps in uh, providing effective and efficient uh, equal uh, resilience uh, programming uh, that is built in uh, equality and equity. Uh, determine whether specific measures are needed to ensure equitable results for women and girls. Uh, Sabrine maybe uh, can add, uh, for example, if we are having a community with disability, uh, maybe you can give an example about what measures we need in that community as part of our response. Yeah, for example, we, we just when we were talking about values, so the mm -hmm. ability to define the values in the community will be able to, to define which measures that we're going to take. So if we understand that in this community, like in Northwest, in a specific reports, then we are mentioning that the higher prevalence is among persons with hearing impairments. So I'm wondering how many of the responded and during the earthquake, they were using adapted modules, not only calling people to be able to recognize that there is people under the, this um, uh, maybe buildings that they have uh, uh, hearing impairments. So this is also when we are understanding not only the prevalence of disability, but also which type of disabilities that people are experiencing and how they are able to adapt the, the measures to be able to, to save and to protect people. Yeah, adding to what uh, Sabrine was saying, like considering all of that will contribute uh, for equality results. And which is our mandate? We are working as a humanitarian. We are uh, not leaving anyone behind. We are targeting all of the community without any discrimination. And this is our uh, own mandate. And this is why we have to, to look at the different needs or the different needs of the different uh, groups. Uh, addressing underlying causes and help long-term programming. When we understand uh, what are the issues? Uh, we will uh, um, like save money, save efforts, save uh, human resources. And uh, also when engaging the uh, community in our response and in our analysis, and we know where and how and why we have these inequalities, we can uh, have uh, accepted uh, uh, solutions that came from the community itself. Like talking to children, uh, they are coming with the brilliant ideas about uh, their li uh, livelihood and uh, about uh, 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 their needs. They need to play, where to play, what to play, what do they uh, need to study and where and how. So listening to elderly, uh, understanding what are their needs. Uh, for example, we did the gender analysis recently and we found that um, almost uh, uh, 94 percent of the person uh, the older uh, persons they mentioned that uh, their uh, needs are never been met while um, they are not uh, consulted in the uh, uh, in the response so why we dropped uh, the consultation of those people uh, we we dropped them assuming that they are elderly and those are their needs they need food, they need medicine, while they came up with a number of other issues. For example, they asked for uh, mental health support. They asked for, um, uh, they feel uh, lonely and they are, uh, because everyone is uh, uh, busy with a number of uh, issues, for example, at home, at work. So uh, those people are having uh, mental issues. They need someone to listen to them, someone to talk to them. Uh, next, please. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. so maybe we, we, due to the time, I know that this topic is very interesting and we, we hope that we have more time, but of course, maybe we have another opportunity. So, um, 
We will talk about the disability assessment very quickly, but we will move to the how, while maybe there is some slides talking about the tools and available material, then it can be shared with you after the, the session. So in the disability assessment, just to highlight that ensure the meaningful participation of persons with disabilities, they can be part of doing the data collection and defining the barriers themselves. It's not us assuming or collecting the data about persons with disabilities. It's required to respond to diverse needs and define different barriers without discrimination. And one of the gaps of defining response is toward persons with mental health or intellectual disabilities. It's also, um, sorry, that's tough. Uh, there is also to understand the rules and capacities. It's very important to compare how persons with disabilities are experienced. So not to generalize that all persons with physical, physical disabilities, they have the same experience uh, of barriers in their community. While accountability and commitment, we need to ensure monitoring uh, uh, of how this and report and track the progress of inclusion of persons with disabilities and the implementation of relevant commitments based on the participation of persons with disabilities. So we are committed toward reporting on the change of their quality of life on the way that we are also asking persons with disabilities on the whole cycle and not only consultation, they are part of the whole cycle of the program to look for some of the adaptation and required of changes that might be taken to ensure that inclusion actions are improving the quality of life of persons with disabilities. One of the gaps is that we need to strengthen the evidence base and how we are addressing disabilities and share this and learn. Sometimes there is a lack of coordination to share this and learn and to share information. And this is what might put us in a risk that we are taking the same action and the plan of services without addressing the concrete chain of action for persons with disabilities. Next. Yeah, so on the how, maybe this is one of the how slides. Um, so on the how we can strengthen the, the inclusion of persons with disabilities, taking into account, of course, the gender integrated throughout the whole program cycle within the uh, humanitarian program cycle. So if we are looking for the need assessment, monitoring of risk protection analysis, that will lead to HNO and HRD and then the strategic and decision and funding. We need to, to define uh, through these steps that the immediate needs of people and the underlying causes and then the long term strategic needs. We need to look to the risk prevent and empower opportunities and avoid harm. Why? What are the needed? Uh, what are the needs and how to define these needs based on several actions that we can take? Is it through uh, focus the group discussion, consultation of persons with disability, collecting secondary data, or sometimes using some of the uh, existing tools like the displaced tracking matrix, that there is some available tool that we can use to be able to consult and discuss with persons with disabilities. While through the monitoring of risks, look to the context and the stress to uh, threats to population, how the threats is affecting and the impact of these stress, uh, threats and existing capacities of the population and how people are coping with these threats. So you are not uh, proposing the intervention, but you are listening on how people were able to, um, uh, to cope with these effects. Well, it's why I mentioned protection analysis here, because protection of persons with disabilities and uh, taking into account the gender and age is not the responsibility of the protection clusters only. It's a, a responsibility as a cross-cutting for all the humanitarian actors to ensure protect people. So how the intersect of gender, age, and disability interact with the context and how these uh, protection risks might be faced by uh, specific groups. This, if we will be able to do the first part and having all of the information, we will come out with 
uh, more detailed and depth analysis within our HRO that can lead to a proper and tailored response in our HRB. So we can summarize analysis of protection issues impacting persons with disabilities and for some strategic intervention and programming, sustaining that capacities and the resilience of population, not having the short or immediate need response, then taking that strategic goals and evidence by sharing also and uh, uh, showing and monitoring how this inclusive uh, actions they were uh, implemented and for sure that inclusive funding and allocation and priorities of protection activities should be taken into account. It's, it's required, as I said, that, that gender integrated through all the program cycle, data collection, gender sensitivity, methods of sampling, analysis, and improve the program and policy to gender sensitivity and indicators. So we are not only relying on only having this, this one stage, but we are going through the whole cycle to ensure that we are able to monitor uh, the tailored information. Next slide. Uh, maybe we can use that. This is the slide, last slide because uh, we can give some recommendation after we will do that to the so uh, on the how we need to ensure the participation and empower and prevent burdens. So meeting the immediate needs, if we are looking to, to the how, uh, we are ensuring the participation of people. So people are not passive to receive services, but they are contributing uh, effectively and actively to build the response. One of the examples, for example, looking to the percentage of families who valued education for their daughters and with and without disabilities in the emergency situation while empowering and looking to the barrier to the service level looking to the percentage of schools that are accessible and i don't mean that it's only accessible in the physical accessible can be also looking to the attitude of the community and the, the no discrimination in no discrimination in the schools and in the preventive burdens, we are looking to that field staff are being trained and sensitized on gender disability inclusion. The number of reasonable accommodation that uh, tailored support for individuals to be able to participate equally on learning, for example, opportunities if we are talking about education and the assist uh, number of assistant teachers that provide support individual needs. So this is a one example within the educational intervention that can be applied to several uh, thematic areas. Maybe uh, because of time, we would like to, to give some general recommendation and please feel free also to put in the chat any concrete uh, example or any concrete recommendation you, you would like to, to highlight. So uh, as I uh, as we mentioned in this uh, example, it's ensuring that we build the capacity and sensitize the, the team to understand disability and inclusion analysis uh, within the uh, the preparedness phase of the any programming. It's also that an inclusive uh, response uh, plan would help to operate and identify risk and ensure protection of persons with disabilities. Um, yes, please, you can remove that. <laughs> Emma, you can remove that the slides. And I'm sharing some recommendations. Be ensure that you are also involving affected people when you are taking um, decisions and considering the intersectionality factors. Uh, be sure that also engaging donors when we are discussing intersectional factors, because sometimes we were facing that people were not thinking about these elements, then suddenly when they were start to operate, they find out that they were unable to respond to a lot of needs in the community. So also that uh, engage inclusion focal points within the response is a key to, uh, to ensure that uh, there is people who are dedicated to support 
uh, improving the understanding and, as my colleague said, uh, Stephanie, toward language, especially and attitude. Be sure to involve CSOs and OPTs of persons with disabilities in your response. And monitoring in, of inclusion is very important because it is a, a, an analysis and the response without monitoring how this influence uh, the community is is uh, is keen to to ensure that we are ensuring monitoring and ensuring that the participation of persons with disabilities in the monitoring process is key. While the last one is empowerment. Please be sure that empowering people to be able to carry and to have the resources and the capacities to be part of the humanitarian program cycle and that they understand their rights to raise their voices and to share their experience without discrimination. Uh, if there is any highlight, please uh, raise your hand and come in. Uh, we are sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, I know that this is something that uh, we can talk about it for, for several days and months. <laughs> yeah, and also we shared in the PowerPoint presentation, and as you said, the time is uh, is an issue. Uh, we shared some uh, frameworks for gender analysis and for inclusion analysis. Uh, so I think uh, the presentation will be shared and you can benefit from uh, those uh, frameworks. Uh, some of them are uh, like um, depends on your uh, purpose uh, of conducting the analysis. You can find uh, one for equality, one for uh, GBV, one for inclusion. Uh, some of them are mainstream, like you can find uh, frameworks uh, you can mainstream within your uh, need analysis. So we will share the um, the presentation and you can benefit from those experience. And you can access to a lot of tools through the GPC website also that you can access to the resources. So we can close. Thank you so much. Thank you to you. You stay to the end of this session. So I really appreciate we I really appreciate your time. And see you in another another opportunity. Take care and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much and thanks uh, for the organizers. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so much. you too. Thank you. Bye bye.